Okay, so we'll get started here today. Uh, thank you everybody for in, for joining. Uh, it's been uh, a fun ride with uh, working with Capella and uh, it's going to continue to be that. Um, I'm going to first start by giving a little background uh, of my history with Capella. I started in 2017 when I introduced uh, to Capella by a customer. Uh, this customer was very uh, uh, excited about Capella and was very interested in bringing it into our uh, tool set uh, of, uh, with uh, Siemens offers. Uh, it wasn't shortly after that I built my first model, which was a solar charger. And many of you have, have, have worked with me in the past, may have seen this example. It was my first uh, attempt of really going in and looking at in detail uh, how you could use um, Capella and uh, as a tool to basically design a product. Uh, in 2018, uh, through my uh, pestering of our organization and getting people involved, we were able to uh, develop a product uh, with uh, with our partners, OBO, called System Modeling Workbench, which is basically an integration of, of Capella to our team center suites. Uh, another nice accomplishment happened in, in 2019 where I coached the middle school students on the use of Capella, and uh, they went on to win a, a state competition in our town. Uh, so it's really pretty uh, impressive time and, and really helped validate to me that uh, Capella is a, is a very powerful tool. And then finally, in 2019 and 20, been introducing SMW slash Capella to many, many companies uh, in very various industries. Uh, but the introduction you know, of Capella is not always easy. And that's kind of the topic of my discussion here. Um, you know, when you're introducing Capella, you have to realize that it's 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 something big, you know, and it can do a lot of things. It's called model-based systems engineering, but that's difficult in a way because how do you explain to someone that it's model-based system engineering and there's 50 years of knowledge around system engineering that's out there? Uh, so it's it's a challenge that you have when you're kind of introducing this tool, and especially when you're introduced to somebody who has never seen it before. And so I've thought a lot about this and kind of you know it made it a, an analogous to you know, how would you teach somebody about an iPhone? Do you really need to go and explain uh, how, you know, Apple started with a, a PC with pods that you could control games with and that it could have a microphone, you could have a, a basically a tape drive. And then you have to talk about the history of digital camera. No, you don't. You don't have to talk about all that history and how it led to this. You can actually start teaching people how to use an iPhone. So I was like, well, can we do that? Is there some way that I can bring to people uh, uh, Capella and system modeling and model-based system engineering, can I bring it to them in an easier way and an easier uh, fashion? So my answer to that was basically it's a tool for innovation. It's something that can help people come up with an idea. Uh, it, it helps you understand the problem and it helps you understand the solution. And and that's a, that's a good match for uh, Capella. Uh, you know, in the world of innovation, there's a thing called an innovation matrix. Uh, the innovation matrix on the left-hand side talks about defining the problem and whether the problem is well-defined or not well-defined. It talks about the understanding the domain and understanding was it well-defined or not well-defined and understood. And because of those things, uh, that maps very well to what Capella do. It helps you understand the problem and it helps you understand the solution. So it really then is a tool that you could be used to, to innovate. And, and it actually can help you get to more of a sustaining innovation uh, direction, which is the ideal state that you want to get into as a company, is you want to basically in, uh, innovate on a steady and a standard basis. So that kind of has been my background in thinking about how to explain this to people. And, you know, when you're talking to just people casually, what you do is that, oh, I'm helping with a product that helps people innovate. Now, I had a chance to actually test this out, and that leads me to my case study. Uh, we, Siemens had a, an, effort, an event we're on system on digitalization, and we, we had a request. And the request was, can we can we use this technology on a real product? And with the events of the world, uh, there was a, a ventilator that was open source. And this ventilator was from Medtronics. And basically, we decided, let's go ahead and work on this product. And let's see how MBSE can help with this innovation, especially specifically with Capella in, in our product called System Modeling Workbench. So part of this exercise was to come up with a series of presentations around this ventilator. And in my case, I was working on the Design Excellence series. And in that Design Excellence, I focused on model-based systems engineering. And it was really a, a great 
work, you know, effort, and it was a great uh, exercise to basically employ model-based systems engineering. And the effort was led by Lawrence Sapp, Sampson, and you can see the entire series that's out on, uh, it's, it's out on uh, YouTube and watch the series. But one thing that's been very interesting is that the topic of MBSE uh, has gotten about 10 to uh, 40 times the hits of other topics. So this is an area that is definitely an area of excitement and an area where people want to know more. And so that's kind of the focus then of this presentation is people want to know more about it and how to use it. And so I'm going to walk you through my example and kind of show you what uh, transpired. As you know, as Capella users, Capella has uh, supports multiple phases. It starts with the operational analysis phase, where you basically understand the problem. It moves to the system analysis phase, where you start to bound and put a boundary around what the problem is. Then it moves to the logical architecture, where you develop what the, the architecture is of the, the product in abstract ways. And then it moves to the physical architecture, where I start really looking at components. Now, in this case, I already had a set of data that I could work with. So in some ways, I'm just reverse engineering that information. But even reverse engineering is very uh, challenging to do. But one of the things that I used and I leveraged in that reverse engineering is the concepts of the, the functional chain. So uh, as you've seen in previous Talus presentations, the power of that uh, functional chain that starts all the way from capabilities that goes to system functions, to logical functions, to physical functions and physical implementations, that this is how I basically did this uh, reverse engineering of this product. I actually looked at those functional chains and basically saw how they were being implemented. I started the effort by looking at the, developing the operational capability uh, diagram of the product. I used the user manual. It was perfect for basically pulling that information of, of how this device is expected to be used. I was able to develop, develop the operational capabilities such as establish the operating mode, deliver ventilation. I was able to depict that in the model and basically be able to get an idea of how this device works. I'm no expert on ventilators, but this made me knowledgeable in how it all kind of fits together in during this operational phase. Next, I took those operational capabilities and deployed them as operational process definitions and, and depicted them in an, an operational activity diagram. You can see here by the different colors that those capabilities have now been transformed into operational processes that basically show what is going to happen when you go to use this device. So an example here, deliver ventilation is the purple uh, operational pr process definition that shows the, uh, the, the activities that are involved in that. Next, I started moving into the system analysis. And in the system analysis, I started pulling out, well, what are the capabilities of the thing that I'm going to make? And in this case, it's the ventilator. Again, I'm pulling on information from the user manuals and basically looking at the capabilities that the ventilator system is going to provide. I've got the ability to connect it to the patient. I need to deliver the ventilation. I have various modes. And all that information is being pulled from the the user manuals to basically populate that content. I became familiar with the capabilities that are involved with the uh, the different hoses and understood the names. You know, so basically I'm doing that innovate matrix is that I'm actually starting to understand not only the problem, but I'm starting to grow in my knowledge of the domain that I'm I'm exercising in. Eventually these capability diagrams then are implemented and they're implemented in various functional chains through the system. In this case, I'm focusing more on the AC mode of the uh, of the system of the uh, ventilator, and I'm depicting that here in the green flow, and then through the orange flows of the system. I'm showing here in the red the monitor patient respiration, going back through the the patient and back to the uh, patient care and support givers. I'm also looking at the uh, patient response to the ventilation process and seeing how that actually is working. And then I'm also defining what's not in the system as the blue flow is showing here as far as monitoring the patient vitals. I'm showing what's in the system, what's out. So this is really the focus of that system analysis phase that we know. It's basically figuring out what's in and what's out of the system that we're working on. 
The next thing I did is I, there's requirements, of course, in this thing. And with our integration to Team Center, I'm able to bring the requirements documents, the product requirements document, and actually bring that into our Team Center product. And when I'm do, able to do that, then I can go to the next steps of basically bringing those requirements and integrating them in with the model. I can use the drag and drop capability to put them right in with the model and, and tag things uh, that have these requirements in it. I'm able to denote the general product requirements as going to the ventilator itself. I'm able to, to basically map functional requirements to the functionals, you know, the functions that are inside the system. I'm able to note, denote things that are inside the system, and I also am able to denote what's outside the system as I'm going through this model. Finally, we get the system analysis completed, and now we go into the logical architecture. This is where most engineers would agree that the fun begins. This is where we're basically now focused on what are the abstract pieces of the system and how they connect together and how they work together. And how they work together is, again, tied by that functional chain that we started depicting all the way up as a capability on the capability diagrams, down through the system functions on the system functional diagram. Now they're starting to be depicted down at the, uh, the logical level. In this particular thing, you'll, you'll see where I've started to divide up the system into its various parts. You'll see that the ventilator now has been broken up into a controller. Uh, the controller has various pieces of software that are inside of it. You'll see that we have a user interface. We have various valves and interfaces with the O2 supply that goes through this same network that's being used for the, the disposable components. You'll see here that I have an O2 valve and you'll see that the air is coming from the external supply. But even in the logical space, I'm basically able to say what's in the system, what's out. And I can also say what's the loop, what's what's the thing that I'm actually you know working with. I can see that the patients inside the system is part of this problem. So we can see now something that we can go further with and actually start using. It's at the logical space that we can start now bringing in some of the downstream teams. And then in this exercise, it was when I got this logical model that I started sharing it with a wider audience to help them understand what was in the manuals and things that I was reading. I was able to take that logical diagram and working with our team that uses the Sim Center product, AIMSIM, they were able to start developing models. They had models already of lungs and patient, uh, patient uh, systems, but they didn't have one that kind of matched the architecture of this product. So by looking at the architectural diagrams that I was producing uh, in Capella, they were able then to align their simulations to those diagrams. They were able to notice that O2 is coming from the environment. It's not coming from a pressurized, uh, or I mean, not O2, but air is coming from uh, an, a regular environment, not from a pressurized source. They were able to um, map the different, they saw that a micro turbine was being used, uh, not a billows to uh, re represent the uh, design. They were able then to be able, be able to, to build an accurate simulation that mapped to the uh, design that they were working on. They were able to then model it. And in this case, they were modeling what they thought may be an innovation. Let's see if we could get some information out of, out of multiple uh, people being connected up to the system. So they were modeling multiple people being connected to the ventilator and basically getting an idea of that. So we were starting then to explore uh, and also quantify what this model needed to do and how it needed to work. And that's pretty much a lot of times what is happening during this logical phase is that you're using the information of the model to basically you know, tune the design and tune the information that you have. But then we started moving into the, and then I started moving more into the physical phase. So in the physical phase, we took the service manual instead now as a source. And I was able to take that service manual and use that to start detailing out what were the various parts of the system. I was able to incorporate graphics and pictures to help people kind of see what the various parts of the system were. I was able to start denoting the, the physical interfaces between the various parts. I then was able to even go one step further and started mapping the functionality 
of these physical systems. As in, you can see here, I've got the software that's in the ventilator software. I've got the CPU IO board with its physical details of the drive and motor control. I've got the motor control board and I'm down and I've got the turbine. It's generating the airflow through the system. I'm really now starting to identify what are both in the software and what's in hardware in this physical design. I even get down to the point of starting to decide what's the functionality that may be in circuit boards. So I'm able to see that I'm going to have a, a PC, a, a CPU PCBA board and the functionality that it needs to deliver. And this is information that's valuable, you know, that would be valuable for downstream tools, uh, such as your, your circuit design, circuit design team. We're basically now using the model to help feed the flow of information downstream during this physical phase. When we finally get this all done, I'm able to capture the information and save it into Team Center uh, to basically add it for record. We can basically save the model, save the representation, and then basically able to share that model with others who aren't experts in system modeling, but just need to be able to see the diagrams and be able to basically uh, mark them up and share them. But the interesting thing is that we still really haven't got to innovation. Uh, and that's where we needed to look at. We, we understood the problem. So we got that well understood. We understood the solution. And we've got a good idea now what that is. And that's great. That helps with this innovation matrix. But we still don't have an idea of what, what actually is the innovation, of how to introduce it. So what I did is I said to my team, I said, I'm going to go talk to some people. We, we want to find out what are they seeing in the field. You know, what problems are coming up that are new today that they may not have anticipated when they designed the ventilator. So through friends, I was able to get an invitation to come over and talk to a respiratory therapist at our local hospital. Uh, he told me, you know, well, the world has changed. It's a tough time. Uh, we, have to go, we have to gown up. We have to put materials on. And he goes, you know, one thing you could really change, and this, this is how long it took for Jeff to basically fill me in. He said, you know, we, we have to put this PPE on. And that PPE is very expensive. It's time consuming. And when we get those vitals back from the patients, you know, it'd be nice that we have to change these settings on this ventilator. We have to basically go in and do it. And is there a way that you could basically give us that could allow us to change the settings on the machine that we cannot do right now? You know, we have some, we have one monitor that one machine that has a display, but we, the cable's not long enough to go outside the room. Is there a way that you could do something maybe with a, an iPad or something like that that would allow us to, to change the machine? And that really took, you know, as anybody knows who's worked with products, you know, talking to the customer is your best source of an idea. And that's what happened. So we found that the COVID had actually introduced new problems. So now it was time to go and kind of address those problems and see what we can do. So going back to the models, we found that, you know, operational analysis has changed. We, we need, we, there's a need for remote operation. They want to be able to do something that we can interact with. So now there's a new operational capability called remote operation. That new operational capability introduces a new operational flow, you know, essentially adjust remotely. They want to be able to adjust the settings of this machine remotely from respiratory therapist who's on the hospital floor, but not in the room. That then leads to a new functional chain through the system level called adjust remote it is basically feeding it from the operational process. But that introduced actually two different flows at the, it's a system level a remote operation flow and a remote monitoring flow. We want to be able to see the information that normally would be on the display of this uh, ventilator. We'd like to be able to see it now remotely, but we also would like to be able to change the settings and basically go from one mode such as CPAP mode uh, to this AC mode, uh, whether it's assist mode. We'd want to be able to do that remotely without putting on the PPE without putting on the all the content we normally would have to do to basically go in it. And you can see in the model where now I'm actually representing uh, the put on the PPE in the model. But I, so I basically want to miss this phase here and save the steps to basically get us to deliver now this system that, that does that. This now then affects the logical architecture, of course. 
So those system functional chains of remote operation or remote monitoring now get detailed out across the logical components. I've introduced a new component called the remote UI inside of the ventilator controller itself. So that's a new behavior component, which is going to be a new piece of software. I'm actually representing that piece of software, isolating it from the existing software with hopes that when we go to the FDA, we don't have to go and recertify the entire device. We're getting clear on what functionality is going to be in each thing. And then we'll develop that into what is the actual exchange of components. We want to basically show this introduction of this new capability. I show in this abstract diagram of the logical architecture, the remote UI device that is now going to be used instead. Haven't identified it yet, but I have some ideas of what I want to be, that to be. And then more importantly, I'm actually denoting, well, what are the processes that the therapist basically wants to do to basically implement this system? So then got with this understanding and this kind of base, base of what I need the abstract to do, I now start moving into, well, what could the physical representation of the system look like? Uh, I started thinking, well, it'd be great if we used an iPad just as Jeff requested. I'm going to need some type of, of uh, I'm going to need some type of hardware that I can connect to, to basically allow me to get the information to the iPad. So let, how about a Wi-Fi hub? I went out a little Wi-Fi fob that can be plugged into the the uh, ventilator. The ventilator had a USB port. I discovered that in my previous uh, pass through the, the doing the design. With that Wi-Fi hub, I could hook up to you know a, uh, basically a Wi-Fi hub or router so I could actually show how it could connect. And then of course, I need some type of, of cloud uh, device, cloud computing of some sort that I could handle functionality that would be involved with that. I then was able to go and take that basic design and start detailing out, well, what's the functions? I introduced from remote operation and remote monitoring of the logical level, I'd realized that I have to have an authenticate capability. And that's where that cloud could come in. I could start looking at possibly using our Mendix cloud at, uh, platform for that. I can use the, the low code operations of our Mendix tool to start developing the uh, sketching out what the iPad functionality and how I would implement that. I basically start showing how those functional chains that started with uh, now could be put together as sort of a design sprint that we could do to basically add this capability to this existing system. So through this, we've started to see that you know Capella is a tool for innovation. It basically assists in understanding the problem and the design. It uncovers gaps in the understanding by basically seeing that we have things that we're missing that we didn't have before. And then eventually, it can lead to that innovative solution. So thank you for joining me today with my presentation. Uh, I hope you'll be able to promote Capella as a tool for innovation. And some presentation like this can help you. It allows you to develop that understanding of the problem that you can share with others. And it provides you as a means to help you methodically develop a solution that will lay a blueprint for design. But more importantly, I hope that the model I shared today can bring forth new solutions. May, it, may this case study help fill some gaps and maybe someone else that has the ability to actually add this and build this product can take this knowledge and, and go forth. Thank you very much. OK, thanks, Tony. Um, well, it's nice to see this uh, this uh, presentation. We have a few questions. Uh, yeah. First one is an easy one. Um, how much time did it take you to build the initial model that you shared? Well, I have to say, I have a little bit of experience doing this after the last couple of years. Uh, so I think it took me about uh, two weeks to build that initial model. Uh, building any model is always a, a fun activity. Uh, it start operational analysis and system analysis uh, usually go very rapidly. Uh, I always kind of say it's kind of a little bit of an exponential curve. It starts with, uh, you know, maybe one day for operational analysis maybe another day for system analysis, and then maybe three days for the logical, <laughs> and then uh, five or six days for that physical model, because the, as you go lower and lower into the model, there's more and more detail that you're leaning out. And actually, uh, the fact that I was reverse engineering uh, a product made it even a, a little bit more time consuming, because I'm actually trying to really honor the design and the information's there. So it did take some time to do it. but. The time was well spent because I'm actually learning the product 
so that when I actually went and had a conversation with a customer, I didn't design this product. I went and took this information and went to talk to an actual customer. I understood enough about how it was put together that I, I could have a, a reasonably decent conversation. So. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question. Is it possible to launch simulations or at least transfer simulation parameters to AMSIM or other tools from Capella? Yes, it is possible, and we're working on you know better and tighter integrations. We're actually doing it right now with some uh, proof of concept code, and we are working to uh, make productize that within the next uh, year or so. So it's a very exciting time to basically do that. And you know one of the reasons why that it's you know happening right now is that we really now have with our integration uh, the uh, information now going into Team Center that allows that to take place. And that actually just came out in our last release uh, uh, that happened in the August timeframe. So that that, was, that release is really was criti critical for that to happen. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, did Siemens develop an interface between Capella and your simulation tool, or was it a human transfer using the model as a reference? Right now, it was a human transfer. Uh, and it was done by, you know, and actually what's interesting is, and this is the challenge that you get into, is that we had a model. We already had an existing model, but it was the, the human transfer of, of basically me having a conversation and showing the model. They're like, oh, well, that's not the way we did it. So again, communications can't be, uh, can't be denied as being extremely important and modeling tools help with that transfer of the information. Uh, so that's part of the challenge that you get into when we're going to do these types of integration between tools is we not only have to worry about, it's not just people aren't starting with a clean slate with modeling tools. They have, especially if you have a lot of domain knowledge, there's much content that exists. So they're going to need ways to basically take what you have with your conceptual idea and then convert that into something that they have that they can leverage the the many models they may already have in that domain. So that's what makes it challenging to basically do these integrations. It's not, uh, it, it seems simple at first, but when you start looking at it, you realize you, you've got to be able to be compatible with their libraries of content. Okay. Um, okay, next question. Is the MBC case study available? I didn't quite get that question. Um, is your uh, model or is there any documentation on this? Uh, this uh, return of experience. Yes, I mean, there is a model. Uh, model does exist for this uh, presentation and it can be shared. If that's what you're asking. Uh, yes, and I assume the question is where can I find some documentation? <laughs> uh, you reach out to me and we'll, we can exchange the information. I can get somebody a care package. Okay, so <laughs> So it's yeah. like, yeah, I'd like to see this uh, get implemented uh, because I think it's a it's a it's an excellent exercise, especially for a company. And uh, in this particular case, we're looking at basically a portable device uh, that could be used in many different circumstances. So it'd be really interesting to see it. Yeah. You, you can follow through. Uh, okay. Next question is quite quite interesting. Um, how much engagement did you have with other people when you developed this model? We, we met probably um, at least a couple times a week uh, as I was developing the model. Uh, most of it I was able to pull from the design. I am an electrical engineer by background. Uh, the material, I was very impressed with the content that was uh, actually, uh, that Medtronic's actually published. So that helped a lot. But we met a couple times of the week because we were immediately starting to feed the content downstream. People wanted to be able to use it for their modeling and simulations. Uh, we wanted to use it for other examples that we were working on, uh, particularly with uh, circuit design. Uh, so they, they, as I was going through and capturing the model and kind of you know, figuring out what's in it, they were immediately wanting to consume that downstream. Okay, next one. Uh, technical flow of scenarios are described as arrows with different colors on the architecture diagram. Uh, any reason for not using activity diagram or similar diagram such as seconds diagram? Um, what kind of, what, I didn't quite get that. Of what kind of diagram was that? Uh, you you used... Uh, I can see it. Uh, yeah. Technical flows, okay. Okay, I did use an act. 
I, I didn't use an activity diagram because essentially the functional chain produces an activity diagram. Um, if I, uh, so basically what you do is it's very easy to create these functional chains from a functional chain. You can actually take that particular piece of information and turn it into an activity diagram. So it's it basically, a, I can sit on the, if you noticed when I had the functional chains up there, there was a little legend object on the right. Uh, that legend object on the right can be opened up. And when you open that up, that actually gives you an entire diagram that represents the equivalent of an activity diagram. And there's technology more detailed in it too, where you can actually do an enhanced functional flow block diagram. Uh, I don't know if we can go to uh, another screen, but if you, we can go back to the screen that I was sharing before, um, I can actually show that uh, I do have Capella up in a window uh, and that's not a, <laughs> An unusual thing for me to do. So, you know, the example here is this, this was the flow that we were talking about right here for, uh, let me go to a logical view. This is, so I can go for instance here and, and open up that diagram. And then I can basically edit that activity or diagram from this view here. So I can actually modify. Now this is one that wasn't quite as pretty and deep prettied up, but I can do that from any of the different model levels that I have. So if I wanna go back to my system analysis level and open up that particular view of that model and see a, a particular functional flow through it, I can do this. Thing. So I can go and open that flow. And that gives you a view that's equivalent essentially to an activity diagram when you do that. And there's a lot of detail. So that's really the why I didn't do it. Now, I also can convert these functional chains into scenario diagrams. If you prefer uh, a scenario diagram view, especially if you're going to you know, incorporate timing and, and constraints around that, you can definitely do that also. And there's that's a simple conversion process to do that. The, the interesting thing is these objects, the functional chains are represented in the object model of Capella. It's not just a diagram, so it can be rendered in different views and be used. Uh, they can be nested. They can, and basically put. You can build uh, large functional chains from small functional chains. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Uh, what made you to use the top-down approach? Was it obvious from the beginning of the conception? I. I Use the top-down approach because I really wanted to go through that process of understanding uh, what the problem was. I really didn't know much about, you know, as much about ventilators as I really needed to. So doing top-down made made sense to do that. The other advantage of going top-down was is that Capella has this concept of transitioning, so that when you create objects such as a, an activity, the activity can be turned into a system function, and the system function can turn into a logical function. So going top-down. Uh, made a lot of sense in a way to do that because I was able to then take advantage of the fact that I didn't have to recreate objects that I created at the higher level, essentially at the lower level. And, it's, and it is also, you know, indicative of how you would want to introduce change. You want to introduce the change essentially by defining the capabilities first of something and then basically exploring, you know, exploiting out or blowing out the capabilities into these functions. And then, and then the functions basically then are being delivered across sets of components. So as we, as you saw in Juan's previous presentation, that, that's the way you would introduce change into your system, you know, in a more agile way. So going from the top down is how you do it. Now, that doesn't mean you don't already have existing components. Uh, you may have library, you may have components that you're affecting that have been around for a long time. And, you know, you can exploit the Capella's capabilities of libraries to do that. So. Okay, and in the physical diagram, what kinds of connections uh, uh, are you describing? Electrical, mechanical, software? Or do you decide which one to represent? Yeah, ba basically, I present usually all the different types of uh, of, of in in interfaces that I can, you know, basically put up here. I'll, I'll basically even denote the interface. So in this example here, I basically had the uh, the therapist uh, uh, basically being noted. I don't know if this is on the screen. So basically the therapist I basically denote as the interface as being a UI interface. Uh, I basically have here, this is Wi-Fi, uh, this is USB, 
So I actually am denoting different types of interfaces. Other systems, I may say this is a, a physical you know, interface. Now, there's no uh, hard and fast rule of basically denoting uh, the types. Uh, it's something that could be done. You could subtype these types of physical interfaces, possibly with a, an extension or a viewpoint. Uh, I typically just you know, use terminology like mechanical, physical, uh, UI, and I'll denote that uh, as in the name of the object. And of course, these are, you know, this is basically this physical diagram is, this is the physical implementation. And then there's, of course, component exchanges and functional exchanges. Uh, the functional changes ma map to the component and the component exchanges map to the UI, the physical exchanges. Okay, thanks. And probably my last question. Um, well, you personally answered that, but that's uh, the main one. What is the relationship between Capella and the tool for hardware, software, and simulation? Uh, right now, there, like I mentioned, the relationship is uh, we can take the model that we basically create, and I can bring that model and bring it into a team center. We can then make relationships. We can connect from the model that represents the architecture to the downstream tools that are going to implement you know, the simulation or to the, in, in some cases, it might be the CAD design. But right now, the, uh, the at current state, we are just in the process of developing exchanges between the tools. We do have exchange, let's say, right now between system modeling workbench and uh, the, our capital line of products. So we are able to, to exchange information. Uh, this is an area that we're, we're focusing a lot now, now that we have a good solid representation of the model going into our PLM system. Okay, thanks. It was nice to have told those insights. Uh, unfortunately, I will have to prepare the next talk. Uh, so thanks again, Tony. And You're very welcome, Samuel. I will leave you uh, and, and I will be back in, in sh short moment. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day, Tony. I'm basically answering on the chat window. If you anybody have any uh, questions, I'm not sure if I'm still live or not, but I think I am basically from what I can see here. <laughs> okay, there's a couple questions were asked about uh, whether uh, integrating in with the hospital could be done. Uh, actually, we talked to Jeff about that, and he said, no, not really. That you know, We got everything we need. But then again, that's, uh, you know, I think you know once you introduce the concepts like adding a cloud to this environment, being able to pull that information from the cloud environment to uh, to, to uh, a system would be ideal. Um, let me see. I'll look through some more of the questions here. Yeah. The, now managing the two D and three D design, we actually did start bringing in two D and three D uh, design content into the system. Uh, we can then link from our model that we've now saved in Team Center to the 3D and, and 2D design uh, information. Uh, is Arcadia a waterfall style? Arcadia is a waterfall style, but you can do it in Agile. I think you saw that in my demonstration. Uh, Team Center does work with, uh, it does work with uh, version 4. Uh, yeah, it is available in 4.3 right now. You can do that. Which advice you give somebody? Okay, I think you know if you're going to implement change uh, or add something to change, starting at the component level is is absolutely possible to do, uh, and modeling at that level, and then introducing you know basically at the system level uh, functionality change. You know what do I want to change the system, uh, and then using the concepts of the functional change for that. I mean it's it's not totally you don't have to totally have to go back and reverse engineer everything. In this case, my focus was more at reverse engineering enough that I could actually have an intelligent conversation. Uh, it, is it clear at Capella how to represent requirements from the operational scenario of a system, but how do you represent requirements that come from other system scenarios, such as manufacturing and testing? Uh, that's a very good question. I think in that sense, a lot of times some requirements will be introduced on the actual components that you may have. Uh, it may be introduced uh, to, uh, let's say, limit. Uh, maybe it's introduced on a functional chain. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, as far as function, especially from the testing perspective, is that you may have requirements that you must be able to test uh, for, uh, you know, to basically run a test. And be, with the equipment you have in the functional chain may be important uh, to basically add the requirement to that. Uh, the functional chain is an object. 
just like uh, any other component is. So you can put requirements on that. And we found it very useful to sometimes put reliability requirements on a functional chain. Through my list of questions here. Oh, I was an, it's an interesting question. Um, sustaining innovation actually talks about road mapping as a main strategy for leaders. Could you elaborate how the model and the approach can be used for road mapping? I think Jan, uh, Juan's presentation was very useful for that. Uh, in many cases, uh, you, you basically want to kind of plan out what you would want to do as enhancements to your product. And those enhancements may come from basically new capabilities you want to uh, address with it. And the new capability, of course, is going to impact various components that are going to be in the system because you're going to basically take that capability. It's going to go to system functional chains down to logical and, and down to physical functional chains. Uh, that impact of what you may be affecting uh, when you do these, you're deploying this new capability in the system could very much affect your road mapping. You know, if you're going to be, you don't want to, if you're going to find that you're going to impact, let's say, 20% of the components with this one capability and you're going to do uh, another set of component changes with another capability you're going to introduce, you basically want to do it in a way that you're not you know, always affecting the change to the same things, or you may want to even work at kind of incorporating some of the overlapping changes together. So I think it could be very helpful as figuring out by, you know, as you look at each capability you're introduc introducing, mapping out, well, what does it impact? And based on this understanding of what things are impacted, that could design that that could lead to basically a roadmap strategy of what uh, things are going to go in first, uh, and and lead to that kind of uh, you want to minimize the impact of changing uh, a component to basically one change instead of many, uh, and that would then lead to an idea of what also you would test. So I think that's a very very important question there. Yeah, so what we're leaning towards uh, with the development of integrations of tools and we're, we're discussing is uh, we are basically building uh, this product on top of an existing uh, client that we use to basically work uh, with uh, uh, that we take our the Capella model and basically we this client actually talks to Team Center and puts information into Team Center. Uh, that same client uh, called the Model Management Gateway. Uh, could also be a tool to help you get model information uh, to other tools that are that are also storing and then configuring their information in Team Center. 